The process of protein synthesis is referred to as translation. So that's going to be the next thing that we talk about. We're going to talk about the different molecules that are involved and then actually how the whole process is going to take place. When we do talk about translation, this is a process that's going to take place in the cytoplasm. So we have at this point moved beyond the nucleus. And if you look here on this slide, it's just showing us an overview of the process. And hopefully you can get an idea that there are going to be a number of molecules that are involved in all of this. So as we go through and talk about the molecules, you want to notice what they're made of and what their overall role is going to be in the process of translation. The first one we want to talk about are the transfer RNAs. So these transfer RNAs are commonly called tRNAs. And they're called transfer RNAs because these will be bringing the amino acids. So they are going to be bringing the amino acids to the translation process. And they are simply RNA molecules that happen to be folded up in a very specific conformation. Now the way that they're going to be able to fold up and maintain that three-dimensional shape is because they are going to have hydrogen bonding taking place within the RNA molecule itself. They can do this because the RNA molecule can fold and this is going to, if we just zoom in a little bit here on this RNA molecule, it's going to enable some A's to be across from U's. Those can form two hydrogen bonds between them. And C's and G's can be across from each other. Those would form three hydrogen bonds. So all the dotted lines you're seeing in this figure over here, they're representing hydrogen bonds, which are necessary for stabilizing that three-dimensional shape. Now, once that three-dimensional shape is achieved, we're going to end up with two unique ends on our tRNA molecule. One of those ends is going to be called the amino acid attachment site, and that's what we're seeing right here. This is where an amino acid is going to get attached. We do have 20 different amino acids inside the cell, so one of those 20, and it will be a specific one, will be attached at that site. Now on the other end, that is what we refer to as the anticodon, and if we zoom in on the anticodon over here, the anticodon is three nucleotides long, and this anticodon is going to be complementary, and by complementary we mean opposite, um, a codon. Now the codons themselves, if you recall, those were the three nucleotide words that were going to be used to specify an amino acid. So if we look a little closer at this particular anticodon, this one is AAG, and if we write down the polarity of it. This is the three prime end, and I'm getting that from up here. And then we have the five prime end to it. So that anticodon is going to be complementary to a codon. What the codon that it's complementary to would be, would be whatever goes across from A, which would be U, and then another U, and then a C. It's gonna also be anti-parallel, so we can go ahead and put those numbers on there as well. Now we, figured out what the codon was in this case, because if we can find out the codon, then we can figure out what amino acid is going to be attached on the other end of this tRNA molecule. So keeping in mind that the codon is UUC, if we go to this genetic code table, we look for UUC. So we do see that particular codon right here, and that codon codes for phenylalanine, which is PHE. So since we know that that is the amino acid that corresponds to UUC, that tells us then what amino acid is going to be attached right here. It's going to be PHE. It would also be up here as well. So there will be only one specific amino acid that can be attached to any particular tRNA that we happen to be looking for. Now keeping in mind when we look at this genetic code table that there are 61 different amino or codons that code for amino acids, those 61 codons are going to correspond to 61 different tRNAs. So there's 61 tRNAs. All of those will have different anticodons on the end of them. And then they're all going to have a very specific amino acid that gets attached to the other side. Now there may be multiple tRNAs that have the same amino acid attached to them, but each one will have a different anticodon. It's important to understand that what's on the table, these are the codons. 
and the codons would be things that we would find in the mRNA molecule. The mRNA was the molecule that we made when we went through transcription and then we further processed that RNA. So we added a cap and a tail and we spliced it, which meant that we removed the introns and we kept the exons. So we've got two different types of RNA molecules. We've got the mRNA molecule, which really is our template in this whole process. And then we also have the tRNA molecule, which is going to be bringing in the amino acids, and that one contains an anticodon on it. So if we look at this question here, we have a certain mRNA codon that reads CGG. We want to know what is the tRNA anticodon that will bind to that codon. Well, all we have to do in this case is we look for something that's going to be complementary to this. So if we just write it right next to it, GCC would be the complementary sequence. So this one is our codon, and this one right here is going to be our anticodon. Now, if we wanted to know for this tRNA that we just figured out, so if we draw our tRNA right here, we said that the anticodon is going to be GCC, so that would be down on the bottom, we want to know what amino acid is located on this other end, which one would we look up on the genetic code table? Okay, so in this case, it's important to understand that we're not looking up GCC on the table. We look up the codon. We always look up the codon. So we look for CGG, and when we find CGG, that's going to be right here, and that tells us that arginine, or ARG, is the amino acid that's stuck on the other side of this tRNA. Make sure that you do understand the difference between the codon and the anticodon and which one you would use to figure out the amino acid that's going to be stuck on the other end of the tRNA. Now we do have a specific enzyme that is involved in attaching the amino acids to the tRNAs and this enzyme is known as aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. So that is exactly its job, is it is going to attach the amino acid to the tRNA. So this enzyme has an active site that accommodates both the amino acid and then also the tRNA. And once it binds both of them, it's going to attach them together. And that is then what we call a charged tRNA. Some people call it an activated tRNA. But in any case, it is a tRNA that is ready now to be used for the translation process. Keeping in mind that active sites are very specific for the reaction that they catalyze, we do have a lot of different tRNAs, and we're going to have lots of different aminoacyl tRNA synthetases. So it's not a one-size-fits-all by any means. These enzymes are going to be working their reactions in the cytoplasm, so as the tRNAs that are activated or charged, as they bring those amino acids to the translation process, they will kind of donate them in, and then they will need to get another amino acid attached to them. So these are going to be enzymes that are continuously working in the cytoplasm to keep reattaching amino acids to any of the tRNAs that don't have amino acids attached to them. Now this figure right here just gives you a good overview of the mRNA molecule and the codons that are going to be present in the mRNA molecule. And then we also see the tRNAs there with their anticodons and then also with their amino acids attached to them. So the mRNA, this is our template. Notice that we are going to read it from the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction, always. And this codon that's contained in it, that's what we have on the genetic code table. So that's the one that we would be looking up. The tRNA, which is shown in blue here, these have an anticodon on the end. Notice they are going to be complementary, and they do happen to be anti-parallel to the codons as well, so we can add the primes on there. Now, ignore this sequence here because there really is nothing special about those three letters. But on the other side, we do have the amino acid that's going to be attached to the tRNA. So if we look at the very next one here, the codon is GCG, the anticodon is CGC, 
And the amino acid that is attached is ALA, which is an alanine. And if you looked up GCG on the table, you would find ALA written in there. So if we look at this question, we want to know which of the following is a possible tRNA anticodon for a histidine tRNA. So if we draw us a little image here again, this time we're giving you the fact that this tRNA has a cysteine on the end, and we want to know what are the three letters of the anticodon that are on the other side. So our first step in this case would be to find cysteine on this table, which happens to be in the upper corner here. Once we have the cysteine there, we now have two options here for codons. Keep in mind that the codons are complementary to the anticodon, and it is the anticodon that we're looking for. So we have two codons, which means we have two possibilities for a correct answer here. So those possibilities are going to be complementary to the codons. So our first possibility would be A, C, A. That would be complementary to this one. And then the second possibility would be A, C, G. So either one of those answer choices would be a correct tRNA anticodon that you could have present on the end of a tRNA that was carrying around a cysteine amino acid. The next molecule that is involved in the translation process is the ribosome. And the ribosome is the enzyme complex that is going to be really building the polypeptide for us. The ribosome is made up of some RNA molecules, and it's also going to be made up of some protein molecules, but it is the one that's going to be really bringing everything together in all of this. Now there will be a large subunit and there will be a small subunit, so these are two separate pieces that are going to combine and make up a functional ribosome. If we look here, Within the functional ribosome, we're going to basically thread our mRNA molecule pretty much right through the middle of the two subunits. And we are going to have three active sites that are present and working when all of this is taking place. Here you see them in the picture EPA, but the order that they function in is actually going to be APE. So just remember the acronym APE, and that will help you to remember the direction that those tRNAs are going to be moving through all of this. So we have um, the A site, which is the amino acyl tRNA binding site. That is where any tRNAs that are bringing the amino acid are going to actually come in at. We're going to have a P site, which is the peptidyl site, which is where we're going to be actually building the polypeptide. And then we have an E site or an exit site, which is where the used up tRNAs are going to exit and leave and basically go get another amino acid attached to them. Each site that we have, each active site, is capable of accommodating three nucleotides of the mRNA molecule, which means one codon. So we'll have three nucleotides that fit in the A site, three that will fit in the P site, and there'll be three that fit in the E site. If we look at the actual process of translation, the process of translation does involve three stages. We have the initiation, the elongation, and then the termination process. And I think in this case, it's easiest just to go ahead and show you the actual process of translation taking place. So if we look at this process of translation. In prokaryotic cells, translation is initiated by formation of an initiation complex consisting of the 30S ribosomal subunit, formal methionyl tRNA, and messenger RNA. The 50S ribosomal subunit then joins the complex. Proteins called initiation factors are also involved, but are not shown. The 70S ribosome has two sites to which transfer RNA-carrying amino acids can bind. One is called the peptidyl, or P site, and the other is called the acceptor, or A site. There is also a third site called the exit, or E site, where transfer RNAs are released. The initiating transfer RNA carrying formal methionine binds to the P site. A transfer RNA that recognizes the next codon and carries the second amino acid then moves in to the A site. The formal methionine carried by the transfer RNA in the P site 
is then joined to the amino acid carried by the transfer RNA that just entered the A site by a peptide bond. The ribosome now advances a distance of one codon and the transfer RNA that carried the formal methionine is released at the E site. A transfer RNA carrying the next amino acid now moves into the A site where the anticodon on the transfer RNA matches the codon on the messenger RNA. The ribosome shifts down by a distance of one codon. As the shift occurs, the two amino acids on the transfer RNA in the P site are transferred to the new amino acid and the second transfer RNA is released from the E site. The ribosome continues to move along the messenger RNA and new amino acids are added to the growing polypeptide chain. Elongation of the polypeptide is terminated when a stop codon moves into the A site. A stop codon does not specify an amino acid and does not have a corresponding transfer RNA. The ribosome dissociates into the 30S and 50S subunits and the messenger RNA and protein are released. Okay, so that little animation right there that link is posted on ANGEL so that you can look at that animation again if you want to. But that is a run through of the translation process. We'll hit the initiation, elongation, and termination quickly to emphasize what happens in the different stages. I will say that that animation was specifically prokaryotic cells, but there really is very little difference between translation and a prokaryote versus a eukaryote. So if we look at the initiation process first, in initiation, we're really just um, bringing together the two subunits of the ribosome. So we have sent our mRNA out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. And now the small subunit of the ribosome is going to grab hold and bind to that particular RNA molecule. Once the small subunit binds, then the very first tRNA that has the anticodon complementary to the start codon is going to come in. And when it comes in, it's going to find that start codon and they're going to bind because they're going to be complementary and they're going to hydrogen bond to each other. This means that that very first amino acid, which happens to be methionine, is going to be brought in at the same time. Now notice here that we're not binding to the first three nucleotides that make up the mRNA molecule. So this extra area that we do have over here, that would have been that five prime untranslated region that we have on the end of the mRNA molecule. Now once we get the first tRNA in there, now the large subunit is going to come along and bind. And that right there now is a ribosome that's ready to really begin the process of translation. Notice that that very first tRNA is going to start off in the P site and it does have the amino acid attached to it. If we look at the elongation process, in elongation, the first thing that's going to happen is a tRNA is going to come into the A site. That will be the tRNA that has the anticodon that matches up with whatever codon happens to be in the A site, and it is bringing along the appropriate amino acid. So that one's going to come in. Once it comes in, we're going to transfer any amino acids that are on the tRNA in the P site. They will be transferred to the tRNA that happens to be in the A site. Right then, we are making a peptide bond. Recall from chapter five that when we attach amino acids together, it is a peptide bond that's joining them. So it really is the ribosome that is catalyzing the formation of that peptide bond at that particular stage. So notice that after that happens, we now have a whole chain of amino acids on the tRNA in the A site. And now the ribosome is going to shift. As the ribosome shifts down the mRNA by one codon, we will now have our empty tRNA in the E site and it will then exit or leave. It will then be going and getting another amino acid attached to it 
And now we're really right back to where we started with in the P site because we have a tRNA that has amino acids attached to it. And now we have an empty A site that a new tRNA can enter into. This process is going to continue again and again, just like you saw in the video, until we end up with a stop codon in that A site. When we do end up with a stop codon in the A site, we're going to have a protein that comes in and binds and recognizes it. So there is not a specific tRNA that recognizes a stop codon. It is a protein that's called a release factor. When it comes in and binds, it's going to basically freeze the whole system up, which means everything is then going to fall apart. So our polypeptide that we just made is going to be released. The tRNA, which is now empty, is going to be released. And then the different parts of the ribosome, as well as the mRNA, are all going to be released or fall apart. That ribosome will go and look for a new mRNA that needs to be translated or read. And the mRNA may get bound by another ribosome as well, and we could get another copy of polypeptide made from it. I do want to emphasize here, we talked about the 5' untranslated region or pointed that out. Notice here that we've got extra on the 3' end, so extra nucleotides after the stop codon. Those would be our 3' UTR, 3' untranslated region. And so what we're actually reading through with the codons is not the entire mRNA molecule. So if we just draw our mRNA molecule up here, I want to emphasize that it is a single-stranded molecule, but we do have this little section in the middle that contains the codons, and that's what's called the coding sequence. That coding sequence, a lot of times, is called the CDS, and then we've got extra on the 5' prime end, which is the 5' prime untranslated region, or 5' prime UTR, and we've got extra on the 3' prime end, which is the 3' prime UTR. Right at the beginning of the coding sequence is where we would find the start codon, and right at the end of the coding sequence is where you would find the stop codon. So if we go back and just refresh our minds with that reading frame that we talked about before, there is some choosing of the start codon that has to be um, carefully done because once we choose the correct first three, everything falls into place after that. If we do not get the start codon correct, then the rest of it is going to be all off. We also want to understand that we're not actually reading through every last little nucleotide of the mRNA molecule. So that's the process of translation. Translation, we want to keep in mind, is taking place in the cytoplasm. And the purpose of translation is to read through this RNA template that we made previously and turn it into a protein copy that ultimately we hope is going to be able to perform some job inside the cell. Now, there are many times mRNA molecules that happen to get read or translated by many ribosomes all at the same time, so simultaneously. This is what we call polyribosomes or polysomes. So that's what we're seeing on this particular slide. The bottom image represents an electron microscope picture of this. Maybe a little difficult to see the mRNA in there, but we can certainly see the ribosomes, which are the circular structures that look like beads. Notice they're all lined up, and they're all lined up because they are all attached to the same linear piece of mRNA. So once that mRNA leaves the nucleus and enters the cytoplasm, hopefully a small subunit of the ribosome is going to find the start codon and it's going to attach to it and then we get the large subunit attached and we get that initiation complex, which then can um, read down the mRNA molecule making polypeptide. So the polypeptide that we see is the purple in this picture. Once that ribosome kind of moves along a little bit and starts making the protein, notice that that's going to leave the start codon unoccupied. That means that yet another ribosome can assemble right on top of the start codon and begin reading down and making a polypeptide from it. And then it becomes unoccupied again, and hopefully you're getting the picture here so that we can end up with a whole bunch of ribosomes reading down the mRNA one after another. Now the big advantage to this is going to be that we're going to be able to make a lot of protein really quickly. 
Not only are we going to be able to make a lot of protein very quickly, but we're also going to be a lot more efficient because we can take one mRNA molecule and we can make many copies of protein from it. So we don't necessarily need one mRNA molecule for every copy of protein that we make. Different RNAs have different half-lives to them, which means they last for different lengths of time inside the cytoplasm. As long as they are still intact, they're going to continue to be read by ribosomes. However, as soon as they get degraded, then obviously the ribosome won't have a template to work off of anymore. Now, once we get these, RNA, these proteins made, those proteins are not necessarily functional at that particular moment because keep in mind that protein folding, getting to that correct three-dimensional shape is extremely important for a protein. So after translation, there are a number of modifications that have to take place. One of them is the folding process. So if you need to, go back to chapter five and just review those different levels of protein folding. So we talked about the primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary, and then also the quaternary structure. All of those are very important for a protein to become functional. In addition to that, we have other things that have to take place. So these are typically called post-translational modifications because they do take place after the translation process. And many of these are going to be chemical modifications. So by chemical modifications, we may have different groups that need to be attached to the proteins. So we might get, say, a phosphate group that gets attached. There could be a sugar group that gets attached. We have talked previously about glycoproteins. Glyco means sugar, so those would be proteins that have sugars attached to them. So this would be when that actually happens. So a number of chemical modifications may need to be um, done, so that would be done right now. In some cases, the polypeptide is actually cut into pieces. So the polypeptide um, may be cut. Sometimes it's just a few amino acids that get removed from one end or the other. Sometimes a very long polypeptide may be cut in half and say each half is going to then go out and do some particular job inside the cell. Whatever the modifications that are required for a protein are, this is when they're going to be done. So first we go through translation and we make the polypeptide. Then we're going to have our modifications take place and also the folding. Sometimes the modifications take place before the folding, sometimes the folding takes place and then we get the modifications. Besides all of that, it is also extremely important that we get everything targeted or sent to the right location inside the cell. So proteins, every protein is going to have a specific location where it needs to be. It may be a membrane protein. It may be a protein that needs to go to the nucleus, needs to go to a vacuole. No matter what, all of those proteins that we begin making, they're all gonna start with transcription. So we're always gonna go back to transcription in the nucleus. We're going to transcribe the correct gene that has the information for making that protein. We're going to modify that RNA, give it the cap, the tail, and splice it. So we'll turn it into an mRNA, and then we're gonna send it out to the cytoplasm. When it gets to the cytoplasm, no matter what, that mRNA is going to be bound by a free-floating ribosome. Keep in mind that we had two different types of ribosomes when we talked about them in chapter six. We had the free ribosomes, and we also had bound ribosomes. Okay, all translation begins with a free ribosome. So the ribosome is going to bind on top of the start codon. It's going to start reading along the mRNA and making polypeptide from it. That very first end of the polypeptide that we make is the amino end. And on the amino end of the polypeptide is going to be a series of amino acids which are referred to as the signal peptide. The signal peptide is kind of like an address for the protein. So this signal peptide is going to have information in it that is going to specify to the cell exactly where they want to send this particular protein after it is made. There is an RNA complex called a signal recognition particle 
And its job is to basically bind to the signal peptide and interpret what it says. So if it binds to the signal peptide and it learns that that is a polypeptide that is destined to stay in the cytoplasm, then it is going to leave the ribosome alone and the ribosome will continue its work in the cytoplasm as a free ribosome. However, if it determines that that is a protein that needs to go into the endomembrane system, then it is going to guide that ribosome over to the ER membrane and specifically the rough ER, and it's going to really just kind of dock that ribosome right next to a pore complex. Now, all the while, the ribosome is continuing to make the polypeptide, except for now, as it makes the polypeptide, it's going to carefully start threading that polypeptide across the membrane as it goes. When it reaches the stop codon, it will stop just as before, and everything will fall apart. Except for this time, when it falls apart, the polypeptide is going to be inside the ER now, and the ribosome is out there in the cytoplasm. Now, notice here that our ribosome started as a free ribosome. It was then docked to the ER, and so at that point it became a bound ribosome, and then at the end it turned back into a free ribosome. So what that means is that our ribosomes continuously alternate between being free ribosomes and bound ribosomes. It really just has to do with what they happened to grab at that particular moment in time. We should also notice that if you happen to have a ribosome that is not currently working and making protein at the moment, that is going to be a free ribosome because any ribosome that is bound to a membrane is currently threading a polypeptide across the membrane at that particular moment. Now you might have noticed in this slide that we do end up with the signal peptide cut off right here. Many times that signal peptide will get removed. That would be one of those post-translational modifications where we do have removal of some amino acids. Basically at that point, the signal peptide has served its purpose. It has told the cell where that particular polypeptide needs to go and we have it now well on its way to getting to that correct destination.